Chairman, we are now live. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, I'm gonna start the meeting. This is a permanent review committee on this commission of Chicago landmarks. Today's date, Thursday, June, July 9th. Um, I'm gonna like to call this meeting to order. Uh, first with a roll call, uh, if you could uh, state your name and make sure that, uh, and state whether you can hear and see, uh, see me. Uh, Commissioner Jakovic. Here, I can hear and see you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre. Uh, here, I can see you and hear you. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Here, I can see and hear you. Uh, and is Commissioner Osmond with us? Yes, I can see and hear you. Fantastic. Uh, I am Commissioner Wong. Uh, we do have a quorum and uh, Commissioner um, uh, Leon is still with us in case my, uh, uh, in case my internet goes down, uh, which it has done in the past. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the governor has recently signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that Chairman Leon, as head of the Commission Chicago Landmarks, determines that an in-person meeting of the Commission Chicago Landmarks is not practical or prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meeting uh, meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I want to state, pursuant to the newly created Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act, that Chairman Leon determined that an in person meeting of this permanent review committee of the Sh Commission of Chicago Landmarks is not practical or prudent. Similarly, Chairman Leon made a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E5 that because of the, of, uh, the disaster is declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for, the, for at least one member of the Commission of Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in so much that there is a, uh, no physical meeting place. Pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 4th, 2020, regarding the Chairman's uh, emergency rule making powers, Chairman Leon issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation, effective June 23rd, 2020, in response to the COVID-19 emergency. These rules were posted at the Commission's website. In line with these emergency rules, today's regular permit review committee meeting is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Permit review committee meetings have been held virtually since May of this year. Meetings are structured to minimize chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written, written statements in advance of the meeting. No comments have been received Members of the public desiring to speak at today's meetings were required to register before the meeting and verbal statements by the public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meetings. Applicants and their representatives, as well as aldermen, were asked to contact staff if they desire to speak, and they will be able to do so after the staff presentation on a specific pro uh, project. People have registered to speak on one agenda item, and we now will hear their statements. I'll call out on the agenda items and the names of the persons who have requested to speak. Members of the public will be limited to three minutes each. And in regard to uh, agenda item number one, the project at 225 West Randolph, one person is registered to, to speak, Mr. Ward Miller. So if we could hear from you, please. Ward, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Sure can. 
Yes, sir. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Permit Review Committee. I'm Ward Miller with Preservation Chicago. Uh, we're very excited to see 225 West Randolph, uh, formerly known as the Illinois Bell Building by Halliburton and Root and built in the 60s. Um, being considered for this work. Uh, we understand that this may be uh, ramping up to a Chicago landmark designation of this mid-century modern building. And we're very excited to see more of these types of structures uh, recognized for their integrity and their architecture and their contributions to Chicago's built environment and legacy. And just want to encourage more of these to continue um, and also keep in mind uh, several uh, endangered uh, mid-century modern buildings that we'd like to uh, also include in the future, including uh, but not limited to the Thompson Center and, of course, the Lakeside Center of McCormick Place, uh, both very important structures. So with all of that said, uh, we very much support this um, renovation and and uh, a rehabilitation of this building to this sort of 1960s era spirit and uh, also encourage additional uh, consideration of, of future landmark designations uh, for buildings uh, built in uh, the mid-century uh, and part of that mid-century movement that is also so very important to Chicago and, uh, and the international style and also a great source of tourism um, and visitors uh, to our city. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak and comment on this project this, this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Miller. Appreciate that. Uh, that is all of the speakers that signed up to speak for the, at the Permit Review Committee meeting. And so now we'll go to the agenda, which will start with the approval of the previous meetings, uh, regular meeting of June 4th, 2020. Uh, those were included in your packets. I'd like to call for a motion to accept those, uh, to approve those minutes. Uh, so move. Uh, moved by Aguirre. Commissioner Aguirre and second. Do I hear a second? Second. second. second by Commissioner Hughes. Uh, and we'll do a quick roll call. Uh, Commissioner uh, Jekovic. Aye. Uh, Commissioner uh, Osman. Yes, aye. And I am Commissioner Wong. I approve that. Uh, the minutes are approved. We have uh, how many? I think two items on the agenda today. Three, sorry. Uh, three items on the agenda today. Uh, the first one is a property located at 225 West Randolph. This is a proposed Illinois Bell building in the 42nd Ward. Uh, this is an interior and exterior rehabilitation of an existing 33-story office building, including work to the surrounding plaza. And Emily, I think this is yours. So if you could take it from here. Yes, it is. Uh, so the Illinois Bell Building was built in 1966 and designed by Holliburton and Root. Uh, the 33-story building is one of the few new formalism buildings in Chicago. The tower was home to Illinois Bell, which was a major employer in the city credited with major advancements in the telephone industry. Uh, the applicant, who is the contract purchaser, uh, 225 West Randolph LLC, has requested landmark designation and has submitted a class L application that is currently under review by DPD and targeting a future um, commission on Chicago landmarks meeting. The current property owners, Oakwood Chicago Associates LLC, Elmwood Chicago Associates LLC, Landings Chicago Associates LLC, and Wallkill Chicago Associates LLC have authorized the applicant to file uh, their class L application. So the subject property currently stands only partially occupied and in a deteriorated condition with uh, very little foot traffic. The applicant proposes to revitalize the building by restoring the exterior building and plaza and provide interior rehabilitation to both the public spaces, such as the lobby, as well as the individual office floors above. Uh, so here you can see the original plan drawing showing the building as it was historically. 
Uh, you can see two entrances off of Randolph um, and one off of Franklin. Those are circled in green. And then the original plaza and the planters, which are circled in kind of an orange color. Okay, next. Um, so the applicant is proposing to add one new center entry um, to funnel office workers directly in and up to their floor. This entry will be designed to fit seamlessly into the historic storefront and will sit below a new mid-century inspired canopy. Um, so you can see in that little in that plan, um, the, the new entrance circled in red with the existing in green again. Two new revolving doors matching the existing entrances are proposed to be inserted into the middle bay along Randolph. In between the revolving doors will be a set of double swing doors to serve as an accessible entrance. An aluminum canopy is proposed directly above this new entrance, aligning with the new mullions uh, that are bordering the doors. The canopy is approximately two foot six inches thick and extends over the plaza 11 and a half feet. The canopy is proposed to be structurally attached to the building floor plates and will cantilever out, therefore avoiding any need to be um, directly attached to the historic exterior. So the eight planters surrounding the Franklin and Randolph elevations of the building are original to the building, as you can see on um, this original site plan, uh, and an integral part of the plaza's design. So the three planters along the Franklin elevation are proposed to be modified to allow for integral plaza seating. Uh, it'll further reinforce the connection between the plaza and the lobby. The applicant's proposing to remove an approximately four foot three inch section on the east side of each planter. So these are the red ones um, up on the screen. A new table and benches will be inserted in place of the central planting bed, creating new seating areas while maintaining the exterior profile of the planter. Uh, the applicant is also proposing to remove the center planter on the Randolph elevation to accommodate their new entrance to the lobby. The outline of the removed planter will be indicated by um, contrasting Terrazzo Plaza panels to indicate where it was originally. Staff recommends that because the alignment of the remaining planters will still be intact, the removal of one in the center will not be an adverse effect. Um, the remaining planters will have their fences removed and will be surrounded by new benches and corner planters um, free, free from being attached to the plaza below. Uh, So exterior building repairs will also be conducted as a part of the project scope. The stone panels on the building are cracked and spalling in some locations. Sealant has failed in many locations and many of the panels are stained from decades of exposure to the elements. The applicant plans to perform a close-up inspection, identifying all areas requiring repair um, to address any condition issues found. Curtain wall repairs will be performed as necessary uh, and the existing non-historic curtain wall film will be replaced with a new low tint film. Um, the applicant's proposing to clean all of the facades um, and staff recommends that cleaning chemical specs, new window film, cladding repair details, and any replacement materials be provided with the permit application and reviewed by uh, staff. At this time, no signage or exterior lighting is being proposed, however, in the future, if it comes along, it will be subject to staff review. So the lobby will serve as a usable and shared common lobby and amenity space for tenants of the building. In order to accomplish this, an existing corner retail space, which you can see on the plan um, highlighted there, will be removed and the Franklin Street facing storefront will be folded back into the original lobby volume. This newly contiguous space will be programmed much like a hotel lobby with the previous storefront now housing a bar lounge space. As mentioned before, these drawings also identify the original lobby materials. During a renovation effort in the 1990s, the original flooring and wall surfaces were replaced. The existing flooring is not proposed to be changed. However, the applicant plans on replacing the current non-historic stone wall panels um, with black granite panels matching the planters and original design, reinstating the intended minimalist aesthetic. Uh, the remaining existing entrance along Randolph, located at the northeast corner, 
will direct tenants to a new open stair connecting the lobby to the basement. Uh, this will lead to a fitness area in a currently unutilized space that was previously a large mail room. Um, the stair will be designed in a minimalist manner and be complementary to the original interiors. The new floor opening will not remove any historic finishes um, as the floor was replaced in the 90s and will be located within the lobby's guiding geometry. Uh, so the floor opening is proposed to be approximately 32 by 24 feet at its very widest point. Um, and then a new safety railing will surround the opening and serve as the handrail. Uh, as you can see, the railing is proposed to be simple in design uh, and the main connection points align with the vertical glass mullions beyond on the, on the windows. Uh, the tread will be black terrazzo to match the remainder of the flooring. Um, the upper floors of the building will be refreshed to clean white box condition. All of the existing non-structural interior partitions are proposed to be removed creating large open spaces. Uh, however, the central elevator lobbies and restrooms will remain. So there has always been an intentional drop ceiling, um, which was historically 12 feet in the lobby with a raised 18 foot tall perimeter soffit. During the 1990s renovation to the lobby, the ceiling was replaced with a drop ceiling, also approximately 12 feet above the finished floor. The applicant proposes to demolish this current non-historic ceiling and replace it with a new drywall ceiling that will be 12 foot 8 inches. Uh, the space will retain its intentionally lowered ceiling and raised perimeter and staff recommends that raising the ceiling by 8 inches will not have an adverse effect. Um, so uh, staff is recommending approval with the conditions that um, I already mentioned uh, and I believe both representatives of the applicant as well as the architect is here. Thank you, Emily. Does anybody uh, on the committee have any questions of Emily at this time? And seeing none, uh, the applicant is here. The attorney representing the applicant. Okay. Yes. Um, if you could, uh, would you like to make a statement? Uh, hi, Commissioner Wong. Uh, Paul Shadle with uh, the law firm of DLA Piper and with my colleague Katie Janky Dale. We're representing the the developer. Um, I think Emily's covered everything. Um, I, she also mentioned that we will be back before you. We hope in the near future with a designation and Class L request. Um, the feasibility of the project really depends on that. Um, but. With, with us today are Krista Weir from HPA Architects and then Scott Ebbett and Brian Broder from the development team, ready to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shadle. Uh, does any of the committee have any questions of the applicant or their architect? This time, I am not seeing. I just want to make a comment that I'm enthusiastic that we're seeing um, a restoration of a mid-century modern building that's in the core of the loop, and uh, I'm excited to see the way it's progressing. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Osmond. Commissioner Hughes. Yes, my question was about uh, the planter boxes. Um, are the ones that are removing the center, are there trees being removed from the center? And if so, what are the plans for those existing large trees or bushes? Or I'm not sure what the species is. Uh, I think Krista, are you? Krista. Yes. Hi, this is Krista from uh, Hartshire Bunker Architecture. Um, yes, those trees will be removed. They will actually be removed in all planters, including the ones that um, will remain as planters. And we plan to replant them with um, some lower planting. All the historic images we have um, show much lower planting. So we're gonna go back to a similar arrangement um, where you can see more clearly into the lobby and remove those trees. Uh, is there any plans for, I'm sorry, is there any plans for, for saving the trees or relocating them or? Not at this time, but I'm sure we can look into it. I could probably add a little value here. Uh, those trees actually have, uh, are probably at the end of their lifetime. Um, they're understory trees. Um, they, they are not gonna get much bigger than that. And quite frankly, in terms of trying to transplant them, 
uh, there is not a landscaper around who will guarantee those trees as those as they get uh, uh, transplanted. Um, that's my. I know there's opinion. other options though if we're if we're not keeping the tree whole, right? Um, cutting them up and reusing the material for something else in the future. Um, there's companies that do that as well. So when I say reuse or restore, I don't mean actual keeping the tree in whole because they look like large bushes. You're, you're absolutely right about, um, about the lifespan of them, but um, are they a good species enough, I guess, to use for future materials or? It, it depends on what they are. I, I would probably say that if they are a fruit tree, a crab apple of that type, um, uh, probably not. Uh, most of the trees that are being reused for lumber or uh, milling are usually much larger shade trees or uh, canopy trees. Um, what we've been seeing is are a lot of the ash trees that are infected by the ash uh, borer are used because you can get some longer uh, runs. Um, if it is a fruit tree, uh, my recommendation probably would be to use it uh, for, you know, Etsy projects or, uh, or, or uh, you know, bring them to the barbecue and, and smoke your uh, whatever you want to smoke because uh, it great, gives a great flavor. But uh, outside of that, it, it is very difficult to kind of reuse this kind of plant material at this, um, at, you know, this short. Sorry. That's good. <laughs> That's just my opinion as a landscape architect. Commissioner Geary. Thank you. Uh, it's just a follow-up question to that. I mean, in the spirit of, you know, adaptive reuse and reutilization of materials, or, I mean, our ca carbon footprints, right? Uh, preservation should not be excluded to just be um, um, not address or think about that. Uh, what's going on with the, what's going to happen with the planter itself? It's a, it's a stone. Is it, I, what is the material and what is it? Is there any plans like for, mm -hmm. is there any, it's just going to go to landfill? Krista? Um, I honestly, we haven't started working with the contractors. We haven't started talking about that. Um, but, but it is only three of the planters and the will plant four of them that remain. Um, but we still have talked to a GC and we haven't talked about that um, work, but I believe that's one of the, it could be one of our requirements um, for our sustainability matrix that we have to follow for class L. So we can look at the demo in particular um, as it relates to that requirement. Yeah, that will be really great to consider in your future planning and your conversations with your GC. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I particularly work in a lot of neighborhoods that can use a lot of, uh, you know, transfer of things uh, that are not necessarily um, like valuable anymore for the loop area. So I would, I would challenge you and encourage you to find a way to reuse that um, somewhere. Um, is there anybody else with any other questions? Um, I actually had some similar questions regarding the planners, because if I understand this correctly, you are going to, um, are, are those brand new planters that you are recommending or is this reusing the existing, and they do look like they're precast uh, with this recess at the bottom. Yep, they're precast clad in, in granite. Um, okay. It's three of them that we plan to make into seeding areas as opposed to planters. Um, and I think we were going to use some more pre sanding planters like FF&E um, to replace some of the greenery. Um, but we just found that the planters were a little bit foreboding and kind of preventing that connection between the lobby and the terrace or the, the exterior. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that flow between the interior and the exterior was reinforced by some additional exterior seating. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shadle, who, whose ward is this in? Uh, Alderman Riley, 42nd okay. ward. All right. Um, you are aware that uh, the Alderman is uh, a lot of concern about um, 
uh, people sleeping on benches. I've gone through that exercise with him. Um, so yeah, uh, yes, and we we've had a we've had a, a meeting with him to show him these plans. Um, it's our understanding that he was fine with coming forward with the plan that we have. We can certainly and and will, given the passage of time, connect with him again before we move forward with the class L uh, and designation review. But but we've discussed the plan with him. All right, thank you. Anybody else with any questions? Uh, if not, um, I would like to uh, call for a motion to approve the staff recommendations for this project. Um, do I have a uh, motion? I move. Is that uh, Commissioner Osmond? Yes, I move to uh, okay. forward the staff recommendations on this project. Uh, is there a I'll second? Se I'll second that. Commissioner Djokovic. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Hughes has a roll call. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre? Yes. And uh, it was moved by Osmond and uh, seconded by uh, Djokovic. I am uh, in favor of this as well. As well. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, folks. Uh, good luck with it. It's a wonderful building, actually, and uh, lots of wires in there when it used to be Illinois Bell. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the property located at 1515 West 18th Street. This is in the proposed uh, Pilsen Historic District in the 25th Ward, Alderman Sigcho Lopez. This is a proposed new construction of a four story, three unit masonry mixed use building. And Emily, you have this one as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so the subject property is a vacant lot uh, located mid block in the Pilsen district between Ashland and Laughlin. The lot's been vacant since 2016 when the previous structure was demolished. So the proposed new building is uh, 24 foot six inches wide and 72 feet long with a rear metal um, porch and stair uh, on a raised lot. Historic setbacks in the area widely vary um, and the highly minimal setbacks that are being proposed are well within the range, particularly along 18th Street. So the new building will be four stories and measures approximately 50 feet tall with the setback stair enclosure reaching approximately 56 feet above grade. The floor to floor heights are approximately 10 feet. Um, the building does feature a roof deck. However, it's set back on the roof uh, so far that it will not be visible from the public rights of way. The overall proportions of the building are similar in scale to those seen on, on neighboring buildings. This particular stretch of 18th Street features a combination of commercial buildings, flat buildings, and store and flat buildings, ranging anywhere from one to three and a half stories in height. However, adjacent blocks show many four-story buildings, including those found at 1640 West 18th um, and 1639 West 18th, uh, which have predominant roof lines approximately 53, 54 feet. Um, so staff recommends approval of the proposed building scale as it is compatible with the wide range of roof heights along 18th Street. So this building utilizes two inset front entrances, one for the retail tenant and one for the residences above. Uh, as we know, this is something commonly found in mixed use buildings within the district. The storefront proposed is compatible with the floor heights and arrangement of historic storefronts. Um, with an aluminum bulkhead and masonry columns. Uh, the second and third floors of the building feature a simple masonry bay with just a very slight four inch projection, just enough to differentiate it from the rest of the building. Uh, the window arrangement for the building is common for the district and compatible in size with historic masonry openings and staff recommends approval as proposed. Uh, the front facade is proposed to be clad in Wellsford Iron Spot standard size modular face brick with a gray mortar with accent elements such as the bay in a contrasting Glen Gray color. Staff recommends the color of the mortar be revised to match the colors of the brick. Uh, the building incorporates limestone in the sills, headers, and banding at each floor. The cornice and mansard roof are proposed to be zinc. 
um, the mansard roof and the dormers are proposed to be clad in a standing seam metal panel. This is a contemporary interpretation of the many pressed metal cornices and roofs found throughout the district. Uh, the stair enclosure behind is proposed to be clad in a fiber cement siding um, and will be minimally visible and staff recommends approval as proposed. Uh, so as I said, we are recommending approval with the conditions that I had already mentioned. Um, and uh, both the owner and the architect are here uh, to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Emily. Does the committee have any questions of uh, Emily at this time? And seeing none, um, uh, would the applicant like to make a statement? I have one question. Nice job. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Commissioner Jeffovich, for Emily. For Emily, yeah. Um, yeah. What's the what's the recommendation on the color of the of the brick? Um, uh, but the, I would just say that the one thing that jumps out at me in in, in black and white, I think it, uh, the massing looks pretty good in terms of matching the context and everything. But uh, when the bay is of the same material in the district, it seems to be of a matching color. And I think that the one thing that kind of throws it off when you look at the rendering is the color, uh, the differentiation when it's the same material. So I think, it, like I said, in black and white, I think the proportions are right. And it looks like it's trying to match the proportions. It's not trying to stand out as a modern, real, like modern building. Um, so I would just, I, I guess I would recommend that the colors are the same uh, on the masonry. And I'm not sure, I think that's what your recommendation was, but I wasn't sure, so. Uh, the recommendation was just so that the, the mortar colors be revised to match. Oh, okay. But I think, uh, I mean, the, the architect and applicant are here. That's definitely something they would probably consider. Um, I don't want to speak for you, Mike or Peter. <laughs> True. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do it one way or the other. Um, Mike, Mike, if you could uh, state your name and. and uh, Mike uh, Fox, I'm the owner of the property. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and your your uh, your response to uh, Commissioner Jekovic's question. Our designer might not be too happy, but uh, I'm not married to it one way or the other. I think that she was trying to tie in the you know bay colors uh, with the banding that she has going across the other accent brick soldier courses that you see uh, that kind of cut a crew across uh, the top of the windows on two and three, you know, just to, uh, just oh, to yeah, I can see. and certainly, certainly with a brick, I, I, I totally understand what he's saying. The, the brick on facades on many of the buildings when you cut across the bays are the same. Um, but of course, a lot of the bays are either painted metal or no, they're probably not copper, but, copper, but they're probably all some sort of painted galvanized metal of some sort. Uh, right. And I think we were just trying to kind of take off of that a little bit. Okay. It wouldn't be the end of the world to have it be the same brick color. All right. Any other questions of the applicant right now? I guess the only thing that I, I would ask uh, Mr. Fox is, um, and I understand that, you know, the, uh, the conditions are along 18th Street are typically with the storefront um, retail at the bottom. But, you know, as I drive along 18th Street, there are a number of uh, storefronts that are very vacant. Um, uh, could you you want to can you address that? Or perhaps you already have a tenant? We don't have a tenant. We have several other uh, stores, both on 18th Street, Laughlin and um, Blue Island. And we have one, two, three, four, five stores. Four of them are occupied. I do think there is a little more of a demand for a newer space. When we build out, uh, either build out brand new or do a, a large renovation, and we do uh, retail space, I always, I give everybody what I call just an, uh, an overdone vanilla box. And I always, think restaurants, although they certainly aren't all restaurants. Uh, and so it kind of gives everybody a little bit of a head start 
when it comes to them doing uh, their build out. I, I get it. Uh, I, we have lots of buildings like this, lots. Uh, some are, this one's small, but we have some that have maybe six, seven, eight stores in them. Uh, I know the times right now are tough. I, I think if you were an urban planner, you would say it needs to be retail. I think retail breeds retail. I mean, that's maybe been drilled in my head over the years too many times, but uh, I don't think having it be residential right on 18th Street would be appropriate. The zoning currently does not allow uh, residential on the ground floor in mm -hmm. that section of 18th Street. This is what it's called for. And so that's what we're doing. I, I tend to agree with the way the zoning is now. Uh, I get it, it's always changing. You know, we used to have a million shoe stores and ladies clothing and now we don't get too many of those. Uh, it's, you know, fitness and, and food is what we get uh, at least up until four months ago and going forward, we'll see. Um, but I, I do think, you know, we, we do try, we do buy into the pedestrian aspect of retail. So uh, I, I do agree with you though, there's nothing worse for a block than to have vacancy um, I'm not sure why sometimes there's so much vacancy on that stretch. I, I'm there almost every day for like the past six, seven years. And I think some of it's vacant just because it just, you know, I just don't think that the landlord. <laughs> well, maybe you can yeah, start a new trend. I just think sometimes it's the property owner. Yeah, yeah. maybe you can start a new trend with that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not concerned about it. I think, uh, I think we'll find somebody. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I don't see anybody else that uh, has any questions for you. I guess the only, the only thing that I would uh, ask is, um, you know, and you've kind of answered the question uh, as to uh, the brick color. Uh, Commissioner Djakovic, is that something that you'd like to kind of reinforce? Uh, or do you want to leave that up to the developer? What, what would you like to do on that? I guess for me, I think I'll, I'll leave it up to the developer. If, if other commissioners are, don't feel strongly about it, I'll leave it up to the developer. Okay. Any other commissioners? I, I actually would like to see it the same color. So there you go. I'm backing you up. On that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Uh, what, about the, what about the banding? Uh, she has a different color banding on the soldier course. Um, yeah, soldier course would be fine. I, I, I'd have to ask her. You know, so, I, I wear the same color shirt and, and pants. So, um, <laughs> you know. can I can I ask a question about that sure, real quick? Sure, go ahead. Uh, do, you, do you have? Is it just that it's the same, same color? Um, Either of those presented is that the is that the recommendation? So there's no differentiation between um, yeah the two elements. Is that is that what um, uh, Commissioner Jakovic is? It was. I, I just wanted to make sure I understood. I think correctly. so. I, if you go if you go back and look at the streetscape um, slide. Um, you can see that uh, buildings with bays, unless it's a different material completely, it's usually the same color in, in, in the district. And it's usually the same, like this is a masonry bay. So I just, it just stood out at me. And when you look at the building in the black and white elevation, it just doesn't seem, the proportions are pretty well done. It just doesn't seem like it needs that differentiation. So it's a little. I understand now. Uh, so you're saying that the, 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 the the architectural element doesn't really justify the change of material uh, as, it, yeah, as it is observed so. in the rest of the context in that elevation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with that being said. Uh, I, uh, I have a comment actually, Ernie. Uh, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Osmond. Yeah. Uh, so my concern then if we're changing the color of the bay, <laughs> then are we using the right color brick? Because when you look at the street facade and being very familiar with 18th Street, the facade is more of a reddish brick. This brings it out to the dark brick. So I just want to put, uh, if that is a recommendation, I just have the concern that the color is uh, not matching a lot of what's going on in the street present right now. 
Um, for me, I don't, um, I actually, if I were going to choose, I prefer the darker brick uh, for it. But I think that in these, if you look at it, they're kind of all, all different colors uh, represented on the street. So it could be, it could go either way. Yeah. Commissioner Hughes. Sorry. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't have a preference on, on the masonry color. I think they are with this building, the proportions are in line with the rest of the streets. The sizing of the windows, the type of brick that's being used, all of that is in aligned with the district and complementary to the historic components of the district. So the color of masonry, and I and I understand what Yekovich is saying as well about it being the same color, but as far as which color it doesn't, I'm I'm indifferent. Okay. I, Does somebody want to make a motion uh, uh, to approve the staff recommendations with the additional recommendation of of uh, of uh, no differentiation of the brick? Is that the, the bay as well as the banding? Bay and as well as the banding. Okay. Thank you. I will motion that. Okay. There's a motion on the table. Is there a second? I second. Uh, that was uh, Commissioner Gary. Right. Okay. Uh, doing roll call, Commissioner Hughes. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Osmond. Aye. And uh, I am also uh, in favor of that as well. This uh, motion carries unanimously. Uh, good luck, Mr. Fox, and uh, good luck with that, and hope you uh, get more business started trend there. So. Great. Thank you. Love. You're welcome. Uh, the next item on the agenda, and the last item on the agenda, is item number three at uh, the property at 1336 North Hoyne. This is in the Wicker Park District in the second ward. This is a proposed alteration of a rear one-story gabled roof garage to a flat roofed garage with roof deck and pergola on a corner property. And Larry, I understand this is your project. It is, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you said, this is in the Wicker Park Historic District. Uh, the lot has a 50 foot frontage along Hoyne and about 150 feet along Evergreen that contains a, a three-story 1880s brick home that you can see in the photo on the lower right, and also that one-story four-car uh, frame garage uh, along the alley. Let's go to the next one. So uh, property is located on the northwest corner of Point and Evergreen. Uh, that garage is about 40 feet in length and 22 feet in depth. Uh, it's set back about 32 feet from the main house and the garage uh, is set back a couple feet from the uh, property line along Evergreen. Uh, let's go to the next one and you can see these are the existing elevations uh, and then there's another photo in the lower right. Uh, Commissioner Zikowicz might recognize the building to the left there. Uh, that's a new construction in uh, Wicker Park. Uh, let's go to the next one. And these are their proposed uh, elevations. Basically, the garage is remaining in the same location uh, and they are reinforcing it uh, and altering it to accommodate a, a flat roof and a, a pergola design. Uh, so that's, um, that footprint actually won't be expanded, although they will be constructing a staircase on the north side to provide access. Uh, the modified garage has a height approximately 14 feet to the top of the parapet, uh, which eliminates the need for visible safety railings along the evergreen side. Uh, the open wood pergola is about 10 feet wide and 20 feet in length, and that extends about six foot two inches above the parapet and is set back about 17 and a half feet from the south property line. Uh, a wood trellis screen are proposed on the west side to screen views of the alley. Uh, and the modified garage is proposed to be clad with a wood clabbered siding, which is consistent with the historic materials in the district. And they're also proposing a, a double window along the south elevation uh, in order to break up the massing of that, that side of the building. 
Uh, we are recommending approval uh, pretty much as proposed with an understanding that the garage would be painted or stained, which I believe is, is the intent. Uh, I also wanna mention that we got a letter of support from the alderman. It didn't come in quite in time to go out in the packet, uh, but I did receive that support letter uh, the other day. Um, I believe that the architect is also on the call uh, along with the homeowners. Uh, but if you have questions about my presentation, I'd be glad to address those. Great. Uh, does the committee have any questions for Larry? Having none, is the uh, applicant, uh, would you like to make a, a uh, statement on this item? Yes, I, uh, this is John Potter, architect, Morganti Wilson Architects. Um, thank you very much for your consideration. Um, these, uh, these clients have actually meaningfully and lovingly restored this house since they originally bought it in 2004. They have two children, and especially with the way the world has been lately, they're really looking for ways to maximize the property so that their family can spend more time together and, um, and, and really just kind of enjoy the property. It's a beautiful property. The garage itself is in need of renovation. Uh, it was probably built in the 80s or the 90s. They inherited it when they bought it in 2004. So uh, once again, thank you for your consideration. Great. Um, I understand that there was a question regarding the, uh, the pergola. Uh, I under, is that resolved now? In, in terms of its location? Uh, I believe yes. so. We've uh, more clearly delineated it. We've pushed it all the way to the far north. Yep. Okay. Great. Does the committee have any questions for the applicant? Having none, I'd like to call for a, a um, motion to approve the staff recommendation on this project. Is there a motion? I move for uh, uh, Commissioner Osmond moved it. Second. Second. Uh, uh, Commissioner Djakovic uh, seconds it. Uh, for the roll call, Commissioner Geary. Yes. Commissioner Hughes. Aye. And I'm in favor as well, Commissioner Wong. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. This is a, a great addition to the property. And with that, we are done, folks. So I'd like to call for a request to adjourn. So moved. And a second. <laughs> uh, second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> all right. Thank you for your service, folks. Appreciate it. And, Thank uh, you. Have a good, we'll talk good to you. day. Thank you. All right.